We grow so Bible truth. This is so neat. This is this is great. One side is not as many almost as the other side. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here worshiping with us. Uh, I'm going to ask Mission Control back there. How's my my okay, Faith? She's checking. Okay. All right. While that's happening. Go ahead and grab your uh, glow-in-the-dark bulletin that Linda printed. We'll go over some quick, and now actually they're not quick at all, so we'll just sort of languish in the uh, announcements this morning. Um, and I've got a couple to make. Doesn't the sanctuary look nice? It does. Just walking through the door puts you in the spirit. And um, let's check out the church bulletin board. Of course, Bible study on, uh, there we go, just came up, Bible study on Tuesday at 2 o'clock, um, still in Revelation, and I was talking to Pastor, and we had an excellent group um, this past Tuesday, and uh, plan on attending that. Uh, it really opens your eyes as to what we've got uh, to look forward to. Also, um, there is an announcement in the bulletin about Lex and Heidi having a Christmas party, and uh, that is on December 18th, starting at 4 p.m. Um, you can contact them if you're not sure where they live. Most of you know. And um, they have a very nice celebration planned. Also... Um, I wanted to mention the um, nativity ornaments that are on that Christmas tree because we are having a Christmas Eve service again. And uh, that will be on, of course, Christmas Eve. <laughs> oh, I, know, I know what you're thinking. So at 5, 5 p.m. Uh, on Christmas Eve, we'll have, it'll be about an hour, right, Pastor? Candlelight service at the end, singing Silent Night. And uh, after that service is, has concluded, then if you wish, you can come up and take a nativity ornament right off the tree. Pretty neat, huh? And uh, speaking of, of nativity, uh, this, this came to mind. Uh, and it has everything to do with it. The, um, there was a, a gentleman who, you know, in West Texas how lots of little towns are right off the freeway and you can drive by. You'll see one exit and you'll know that you're passing a little West Texas town because it's got a water tower or a grain elevator. And um, so this guy was going through a West Texas town uh, early in December and as he got off, he, he needed to get some gas and he got off and uh, right there on the left was this immaculate, nativity scene in front of a church, right in the front yard. I mean, great attention to detail. Freshly painted, everything looked accurate and was in the right place, really bright, caught everyone's attention. And one thing that uh, he noticed was that the three wise men were completely decked out in fireman's attire. They had firefighting helmets on, one was carrying an axe, they had turnouts and boots, and he says, you know that, he's thinking to himself, that is very unusual. So he went on into town, got some lunch, and then as he's leaving town, he, had, he looked down at the gas gauge and thought, well, I better top it off right now. So he pulled into a, to a minute mark, you know, and went in and, and uh, paid for his gas, and uh, he uh, just couldn't help but ask the lady that was running the cash register about that nativity scene. And uh, he said, you know, it's a great-looking nativity scene. But myself, and I'm sure everyone that looks at it, has got to, uh, to <laughs> got a lot of questions about the firemen and uh, those three wise men. And what is the, you know, thinking behind that? And the woman just starts to well up with frustration. Her face is turning red. 
And uh, she said, well, you doggone Yankees are all the same, aren't you? And he steps back and he, well, what do you mean? And she reaches under the counter and plops her Bible out there and shuffles through the pages and points her finger at a passage. And she says, it says right here, the wise men came from afar. <laughs> Remember, West Texas. Yeah. Okay, moving on. <laughs> okay, if you'd like a copy of that, I have some. So. All righty. Anyway, um, I wanted, um, just wanted to tie that in with the nativity ornaments. And, I don't think you'll see any f wise men there with firefighting uh, gear on, but uh, I wanted to thank the church, too, uh, for your tithes and offerings. This, this church is a giving church, let me tell you. And it's uh, Christmas time, and we traditionally give our missionaries a Christmas gift. Uh, the missions committee will be dealing with that, but... Um, uh, where's John? Oh, there's John. John set up online giving, which has turned out to us, it's working successfully, right? So you can give online. You can drop uh, your tither offering in the offering slot back there. You can mail it in. Linda always puts the address on the bulletin. But we are doing very well because people take giving seriously. So thank you for that. Um, also... Where did he go? Jerry, I saw Jerry come through here. Oh, there he is. Jerry, it's good to see you. And uh, good to see Kim back and Dave and Cindy. And who? Uh, Lolo's over there. Good to see you, Lolo. It's just good to be with the family in God's house. Amen? Okay. And we got Bob and Jake. And where'd Rosie go? Oh, there he is. Glad you weren't a snake. And uh, so thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Um, let's move on to praises and prayer requests. I'm going to write some. Are you ready? Where is Nancy? There you are. You ready? Nancy's ready to go. If you have a prayer request, Mark has the mic. And he will be glad to bring it to you so you can voice it right here to Karen. My friend Tammy has to have a heart transplant. So I'm asking for prayer for her. She's probably going to have to have an artificial heart for until she can get one because you have to get on the list for it. So just prayer. She's saved, so that's good. But her husband's not. So prayers just that God work in this whole situation okay. in whatever way he will. Thank you for that. Good to see the two of you back, as a matter of fact. Nancy, you got all that? She does. Any other? Pro oh, over here to Jody. Our granddaughter that we've been praying for that had COVID is well. She's back to work. The baby's all good. So we're all thankful for all your prayers. That is a great praise. Thank you, Jody. Uh, two things very quickly. Without getting into a name because we do broadcast, we have a dear brother over in the Ukraine who, if you've been following the news, there's some real question marks as to the future of the peace in that country, um, both in terms of his safety and his mother's, also the ministry that he has there. We want to pray for them and the family uh, and the country. Also, without going into it too deep, one of our families here is also blessed by the Lord as she was coming home with mom around Nelson Reservoir. A tire came loose didn't just come off of the, it wasn't just that the lug nuts gave loose, all of the studs, from what I understand, gave loose. The tire came flying at them, um, hit the front of the car, did a lot of damage, but both Peg and her mom are safe. And um, God is good all the time. God is good. Amen. 
Thanks for sharing that, Mary. This church supports a lot of missionaries, but I want to tell you about one set that we support. Tom and Laura Requat, and we got their monthly newsletter yesterday. And as you know, they have been writing the New Testament in Shimpiri because they're in Mali in an area that speaks Shimpiri. They've been working on this, I don't know how many years. But they are currently working on the last chapter of Mark, and it is the last book of the New Testament in order to have a whole New Testament to give to people in their own language. So this is a huge praise, but it's also a prayer request for the rest of the process to get it approved and then printed and in the hands of the people. Thank you. You bet. And as you know, Laura runs a Bible club for the children, the local children in, in uh, where they live. Uh, if you're wondering who these folks are, they're, they're pictures on one of the chart holders back there. And these children memorize verses, scripture verses, um, and get prizes and, and whatnot for doing so. And one thing, I was reading their email that just, I think I put it back there, it's in the slot. They have, I don't remember his name, but there is a young man working on his 2,000th memory verse. Is that not incredible? 2,000 scripture verses memorized. So, um, all right. Any other prayer requests or praises? Linda's got one. Um, if you remember, we were praying for a little four-and-a-half-year-old girl. Um, I got a report last night that she has now finished all of her radiation, and they're trying to get her off of steroids. But every time they try to get her off, it doesn't go well. So we need to continue to pray for her that they might be able to get her off of that. Any other prayer requests or praises? Okay. I guess we've covered all of it. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and ask Brother Rosie Romero to offer the morning prayer for us. Father, we come to you in thanksgiving that we can meet comfortably in this facility, in this country, at this time. We would ask over the course for the next hour, the Holy Spirit would completely encapsulate every word, every thought, every emotion of everyone in this room. That the concerns, the worries, the anxieties, the prayer requests of the outside world can be left outside this building. And we could focus on your word, the wisdom, the everlasting wisdom. We pray these things in our precious Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosie. Time to lift up our voices. Amen. Hallelujah. Will you all stand and join us as we just lift up the name of our Lord Jesus?
God rest you, very gentlemen, let nothing you display. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all and saved its power when we were gone astray. For oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, for oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Jesus, the light of the world. They all prayed for a miracle 2,000 years ago. And we're praying for a miracle on his return. We are in the season of his return. Amen? Amen. Amen. The world waits for the miracle. The heart longs for a little bit of hope. Oh, come. Oh, come, Emmanuel. A child prays for peace on earth, and she's calling out from a sea of hurt. Oh, come. Oh, come, Emmanuel. With the tears of a mother, a baby's cry is the sound of love. Come down, come down, Emmanuel. For he's the song for the suffering, he's the Messiah, the Prince of Peace has come. He has come, Emmanuel.
Before Rosie comes up, this is a blessing for me. You know, in this man, he is to me kind of a trifecta of blessings, Miss Bent Utha. He is not only just a really neat person, but he's also a fellow elder. But most importantly, he's my brother in Christ, who I love dearly. And the only thing that's wrong with Rosie and Jennifer is that we don't get a chance to see them as often as I wish we did. So it's my pleasure to welcome our brother and elder of this church, Rosie Romero. Conflicted. But it ought to be on now. Um, you know, what I want to talk about today, um, the message has just been <laughs> burning in my soul for about two years now. And, and you can tell I'm, I'm trembling, trembling with conviction right now. All right, literally trembling with conviction. Um, the message I want to share with you all today is, is uh, the big picture. Um, and when we talk about the big picture, I, I, Skip is sitting in back because this big picture is so big that I can uh, get distracted and go on bunny trails. So I've asked Skip if if I'm on a bunny trail too far from the message, <laughs> would he please get in the narthex and just hop around like a rat? <laughs> please. And I'll, I'll get the message. I'll get it. But two components of the big picture that are undeniable are love and unity. And it isn't by mistake that 15 minutes ago, I was convicted by the Holy Spirit with a flame that is burning to the marrow of my bones at this moment. And that someone in my earlier life who I was closer to than a brother, and I've got two brothers and five sisters. Um, we parted ways almost 25, 30 years ago and haven't talked. And his wife shows up in this church today. <laughs> it's, it is so convicting that I'm bringing a message of unity and love. And the Holy Spirit walks Kim into this church. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
I'm trembling in humility right now. Uh, uh, we never had words of discord. We just grew apart and we haven't talked. Two weeks ago, one of the things her husband and I used to do is race motorcycles together. And I haven't uh, been racing motorcycles in a long time. But my grandson just bought a motorcycle. Seven years old, little 50cc. And I mean, as soon as he bought it, I started talking about stories about Rick Ducat. <laughs> and all because they live very close to where all our races used to start at Wickenburg. And we would race from Wickenburg to Aguila across the desert. And their home just happens to be very close to our old starting line. So Rick was in our family conversation just two weeks ago. <laughs> Oh, man. So let's get back to the big picture. <laughs> when we talk about big picture corporately, you know, you can be talking about um, financial goals, sales goals. You can be talking about career opportunities. In the ministry, we can be talking about ministry goals and objectives. The big picture. We can be talking about... Um, a lot of things, but there's really only one big picture, only one that will stand from everlasting to everlasting, that will stand unchallenged, that will stand absolutely perfect for all of time, the big picture. And you know what? This little church plays a role in that big picture. Uh, this church is about 35 years old. Generally speaking, that would be considered about one generation. Okay? We filed the Articles of Incorporation on this church March 6th of 1990. Sometime about 86 or 87, five people met on a hill somewhere is overlooking this piece of property. The property was already purchased and paid for. <clears throat> somewhere is on a hill. Five people stood there. One of them was Pastor Franz Tomlinson from Alpine Baptist. And then there was Ralph and Evelyn Moore. Uh, and then there was a woman by the name of Mary Pugh. I don't know who the fifth person was. Bob, maybe you do. They prayed that with this property paid for, they wanted it to be an implement to fulfill the big picture of God's plan in Nutrioso Valley. This church started with about five attendees, and we all met in the little house right back here that has the sunroom on the side of it. That was Ralph and Evelyn's home. We got to where their living room wouldn't quite hold the nine or ten people, and we moved the, the church to the community building, the masonry community building in, in Nutriosa. And we'd have, Ralph and I would have to go, come on in, come on in. Ralph and I would have to go there, about, and Bob, and we'd have to go there about an hour before service started. The building wasn't being used at the time. We had to get in there, start the heater, sweep up buckets of flies, and have, have a service. Um, the Articles of Incorporation were filed. We became a formal 501c3. And I was called up in about the summer of 1988 and asked, do you think we could build a church? I had a construction company down in the valley at the time, and I said, I, 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 think, we can, I think we can put the resources together and get this done. The church was built originally on this property, but about 200 yards to the north. Um, in getting the church started, it was associated with a missionary group by the name of American Missionary Fellowship. American Missionary Fellowship's original charter goes to the 1700s, and it was founded by Puritans who decreed that their objective, their mission statement, 
was any community that wanted a Bible study was going to get one. And that missionary group is still in existence today. It's now called In Faith. But that missionary group filled the pulpit at New Joseph Bible Church in the earlier years with rotating, a stable of rotating, traveling people that were willing to come up here and give messages. We then had a pastor in Eager by the name of Greg Summers, Greg and April Summers, who were teaching at the Bible Church. And thank goodness the big picture doesn't depend on Rosie Romero or Bob Opple's memory. Because neither one of us could remember what church Greg Summers taught at. <laughs> so Bob, being the wise man, is called Phyllis. <laughs> and it was the Bible church meeting at the Seventh-day Adventist church in Eager. The Bible church, Greg Summers. Greg would teach there in the morning and come out here and we'd have an afternoon service. We then called a young couple with a brand new child, Mary Pugh, one of the original founders who prayed on the hillside to claim this valley for the work of God, had a single wide trader home right here on the corner of the property. And they opted to sell it to the church for a parsonage. Well, uh, Dan and Teresa George moved in with their newborn. That didn't work out. They ended up moving into Eager and renting the house from the Moors, as I remember. Again, thank God, the big picture doesn't depend on my memory. So Dan and Teresa George came, and one of the men from American Missionary Fellowship moved up here, one of the young men, and they had a youth ministry, and they were actually driving up to the top of the plateau north of town in a, in a van and picking up van fulls of children and coming and holding a Sunday school service and a worship service right here in the little church. We then called a pastor who came all the way from the state of Washington, a man by the name of Mr. Hackett. Uh, Mr. Hackett was replaced by a man by the name of Mr. Hobda, Gene Hobda. Gene Hobda was a professor and administrator at Phoenix Christian Union High School for years in the Valley. Uh, pastor Hobda was here a couple of years. We then called a man many of you know, Mr. Jim Frazier, who was actually one of the rotating pastors that was coming up here. And he and Miss Elizabeth, his wife, came up and decided, you know, we're being called here. I'm retiring from my teaching uh, career uh, at the high school. I've, uh, I've accomplished my seminary degree from Phoenix Seminary, and uh, we're being called here. Um, and then, as you know, Pastor Frazier was, uh, uh, needed to wrap up his ministry here, and we reached out to Pastor Tom, um, who agreed to fill the pulpit while we continued our search for a full-time pastor. <laughs> <laughs> the big picture is this church started with five people praying on the side of a hill overlooking the valley. You all here to worship in song and dive into his word is a testimony to the role you are all individually playing in the big picture. And you know what? Being uh, on the debate team, I was always the devil's advocate. <laughs> They'd always send me in there to tear them apart. Um, I could take each one of you individually into a private room with this church's statement of faith constitution and bylaws and I know in less than 10 or 15 minutes I don't know but I'm fairly confident in 10 or 15 minutes I'd find some point of it of contention between me you the elders and you know what that isn't that isn't the testimony of this church not diving into divisions but a picture of the unity and the love that are two key components of the big picture okay so that's New Jerusalem Bible Church, about a generation old, 35 years. Fasten your seatbelts and let's get in the time machine and go back 3,500 years. That's 1,500 generations ago. And let's go to the book of Psalms 
You know, the book of Psalms is an interesting book. It's the largest book in the Bible. It actually constitutes five different books written over a time period of almost 900 years. The earliest is Psalm chapter 90, written by Moses. Well, we all know a psalm was wrapped up by David and Solomon. So we're, we're dealing with about 900 years, multiple authors. There's some psalms we don't even know who authored them. They're called the orphan psalms. But there's five books and 150 chapters. And it's amazing how that, over all those authors, over all those years, can be painting one big picture. Just one. Each of the five books constitutes a particular story God wants to talk to his chosen people about. And I want to take a look at book four today, which starts in chapter 90, which is, like I say, the oldest of the Psalms written by Moses. Now, book four is written when the chosen people are in Babylonian captivity, which we studied, thank you, Bruce, for today's Sunday school class on the captivity in the exodus of Egypt, a low point in the Jewish nation. The Babylonian captivity, I would argue, was even a lower point. They had seen the United Kingdom. They had seen King David. They had seen the streets of fulfillment, the city of fulfillment. They've seen the temple. They've seen the structure of the 12 tribes and everyone's role. And now, Nebuchadnezzar has come in and instilled a, 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 new, a new king. Now, it didn't work well for that king, Zedekiah. He revolted. He actually started trying to make allegiance with Egypt. Kind of upset Nebuchadnezzar. So he takes Zedekiah and sits him in a chair. Murders all of Zedekiah's family. And then pokes his eyes out and puts him in isolation for the rest of his life to die a natural death. Knowing that's the last thing he saw. That's pretty tough. So we've got book five that's reaching out to the chosen people in Babylonian captivity. Now, Jeremiah has told the people, you're going to be there 70 years, but we want you, God wants you to marry, raise your family, build your homes, plant your gardens. You'll be there 70 years. Get settled, okay? But book, but book four is about get settled, but don't forget. There are no unkept promises from God. Not one. Amen. Not one. The question in Sunday school class this morning was, did the chosen people, did the Hebrews forget about God in the 400 years they were under Egyptian captivity? You know, the decision, I think, the consensus was there was always a remnant, okay? A remnant that kept a, a big picture. So in the Babylonian captivity, they're having to be told over and over and over again. There are no unkept promises of God. Okay? You've had this city. The United Kingdom has been split. David has passed. The kingdom has been deteriorated. The temple has been destroyed. Your homes have been obliterated and you're being exported by foot and cart and donkey back to Babylon. Now that's, Miss Linda, that's like me coming to your house today, burning it down and saying, I'm taking you on a hike to Dallas, 1,000 miles. Now, it wasn't that far like, like, like the... Israelites leaving Egypt. It wasn't that far to the promised land, but they had to go spend 40 years in the Sinai Desert. It took them 40 years to go a couple hundred miles. You can get 
from Jerusalem to Babylon in about 500 miles, but not if you want water. So you've got to follow the water courses. It's about a thousand mile foot journey. Okay, so I'm gonna burn your house and we're gonna start a hike this afternoon. I don't know how long that takes. But you're being told, once there, get settled, plant your garden, marry. And all of book four uh, is reminding you about what's going to be fulfilled. Now, book three ends in chapter 89, where a man by the name of Ethan, how many of you know Ethan? He's only mentioned like once or twice in the whole Bible. But he's mentioned in 1 Kings where Solomon is given more wisdom than any man ever to live on earth. And Solomon is compared to Ethan. So Ethan is a very bright man, well known in the community. And Ethan, in chapter 89, spends seven verses accusing God of being a liar. He says in verse 38, but now you've cast off and rejected us. You've renounced your covenant. You've breached all our walls. You've laid down our strongholds and ruins. All who pass plunder us. Uh, we've become the scorn of our neighbors. You've exalted the right hand of our foes. And he goes on and on and on about, God, why have you abandoned us? And that's how book three ends. And book four opens with Moses. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. It's a beginning of a new book. We're going to quit accusing God of being a liar, incapable of keeping his promises. We're going to realign with a new vision and a new picture of the big picture. Now, I'm going to take you through book five in rapid fire just to emphasize to you the points these authors are trying to make to this nation that, is his, that arguably is at its lowest point in its entire history up until that point. And my conviction to, to dig into this revolves around my family and friends, Christian friends mostly, uh, who are convinced America is at its lowest point ever in its history. And you know what? We may be. But is that where we're going to spend our time dwelling? So the authors of book four talk in chapter 90. Hey, verse 17, steady as she goes. Just do the next right thing. Quit thinking generations ahead of yourself. Do the next right thing. Settle. Plant a garden. Steady as she goes. Chapter 91 talks about my refuge and my fortress. This is where you can find your strength. This is where you can find your courage. 92 talks about you make me glad. I sing for joy. It's the reason we worship because of all the, un, all the kept promises of God over all the ages. Your decrees are trustworthy in, verse, in chapter 93. 94, the thoughts of man or but like a breath. No matter how deep you think you can go in theology and logic and physics, your thoughts are like a breath. Mm. Chapter 96 is a, is a crusher because it talks about creation has not lost confidence in God's promises. Not the fields, not the trees, not the oceans, the seas, or anything in them. Not the fields or anything in them. The heavens and the clouds and all that fly above. Nothing has lost confidence in the promises of God. So don't you lose confidence in the promises of God. Chapter 97, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Chapter 98, for he has done marvelous things from eternity past. You know, I referred to debate club and devil's advocate. I was heavily engaged in apologetics for a long time. 
And I would always take those that didn't believe in creation. And I would ask them, just rewind the, the calendar in your head as far as you can go back. A couple thousand years, tens of thousands of years, maybe a hundred thousand years, maybe a million years. Just, just keep rewinding until you get back to what you would consider the beginning. What was there? Well, the Big Bang. Well, yeah. There had to be an energy source for the Big Bang. There had to be an atom of oxygen. There had to be an atom of protein. There had to be an atom of carbon. Where'd those come from? Somewhere. You can rewind to the point that there must be a solid argument for intelligent design. Okay? You, you cannot, there's no beginning to the conversation about evolution. There's no beginning. No ex explicable beginning. Uh, you can start hopping like a bunny nest. <laughs> 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 See, just one word like eternity past starts that conversation. <laughs> um, verse nine, chapter 99, the Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. That's the word used. Let the people tremble because the Lord reigns. Doesn't just reign right now. Doesn't just reign in this community. Reigns over all the universe all the time. Now, I think there's a song, and I'm not very good in songs, but there's a song that says, and it's a fairly new song within the last decade or so, and Peg, you'll know it, I know you will. Um, when I pass, will I dance for joy or will I stand in awe? You know, I, that, that's, the, that's the basics of it, right? Uh, I can only imagine, I can only imagine, thank you. Um, I can only imagine one nanosecond after we leave this physical carcass. Uh, what do you think we're going to experience? Will you be standing in awe? Will you be dancing for joy? I know for a fact I'm going to be in complete embarrassment on how little I kept God the whole time I was here. I'm going to break through and think, Seriously. And I'm going to be in that state of mind probably for the first couple hundred million years. <laughs> Do you think we would, ever, when, when you meet a new person you're impressed with, there's an amount of time that goes by where pretty much you're familiar with that person and you can have a relationship with them unlike the reverential position you held them in before you got to know them. Do you think we're ever going to reach a comfort level in the presence of this God who is in absolute control of this one big picture? I don't think so. I really don't. So chapter 99 is the Lord reigns. Chapter 100 is... Know the Lord is God, and know this, the Lord is good. Chapter 101, he, the, the author encourages us to ponder blamelessness, walk with integrity, not set before your eyes anything that is worthless. Those are big encouragements. Those are big concepts. They're ginormous. In chapter 102, it's a song of penance. Now that he's asked you not to put anything before your eyes that's worthless, do not hide in my distress. Come to me in penance. Chapter 103 is five things that God has done for every one of us. Forgives, heals, redeems, crowns, and satisfies. Chapter 104 establishes God as the creator and the sustainer. Set the earth on its foundation so it may never be moved. It's going to be moved, but not until he decides. <laughs> Chapter 105, and the book is coming to an end now. Chapter 105 is kind of recapping these lessons about not forgetting. Hold your thoughts captive. And it says, make known his deeds. 
Chapter 106 is a chapter of confession. So be reminded of God's greatness. Be reminded of the breath that you are, but be aware of the role that you're going to play and the, the role God has called you to participate in. And the doxology of chapter 4 is this. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting backwards to everlasting forward. No end, no beginning. And let all the people say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise so the big picture, uh, and, then, and then the great thing about the, the structure of the book of Psalms, is that's book four. Okay, Babylonian captives. Don't forget, don't forget. Keep your focus. Keep your, keep your mind in the right place. Chapter 5, which starts in chapter 107 and goes to a chapter 150, is all about the kept promises of God. That's all of book 5. It's abs And when I read Psalm now, I always go to my little spreadsheet cheat sheet and say, okay, what chapter is this in? And what is the focus of that particular book? It changes the way I read through, study, and am enriched by the book of Psalms. So, what is the big picture? Um, Isaiah 14 talks about the son of dawn, son of day, who by his volition carries a big part of creation into chaos by saying, I will. I will rule. I will sit on the throne. That's Isaiah 14. The beginning of chaos. That didn't change the big picture. Okay? But it put in control of this earth a being that is destined, is incredibly brilliant, and is destined to keep us distracted from the big picture. Distracted by our theological differences, by our differences in what we do or don't like in our worship music, differences of our politics. And you know what? You can just take a few minutes every morning. I was going to bring the last five pages of the cover of the Arizona Republic. If, if, if you don't think there aren't distractions, there's a new, a new variant to this virus. It's going to wreak havoc on all of civilization. Uh, there was a senseless murder at a high school in Michigan with a guy shooting students because he was upset with the teachers. There's an administration uh, in charge of this country right now. Some of you may or may not agree with their, their rules. Don't spend your time anxiously chewing your fingernails over the distractions that are in the angelic warfare that is this life. Keep your mind, keep your heart restored, replenished, and energized and empowered by the filling of the Holy Spirit with a focus on the big picture. And when I want to do that, when I'm overwhelmed with the horrid news of the day or the distractions, I have my favorite verses. I go to Deuteronomy 4. talks about keep that word on your mind. When you lie down, when you rise up, when you walk by the way, teach it to your children in chapter 6. Ecclesiastes sums it up pretty well in two verses in closing chapter 12. It says, hey, the whole sum of this, after, after the author of Ecclesiastes talks about the vanities, the vanities, and what profit is there in life, things come, things go, there's a time to count, there's a time to let go. It makes no sense. And he finishes with, but the wholesome things is uh, keep God's commandment. <laughs> Stay focused on keeping God's commandment. Be holy. Strapped to a bed in the ICU for almost three months. I can't tell you how many times I prayed Philippians 4. Uh, set your mind on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, beyond repute. And 
while you can lay out here in a cot and look at the clouds, and, oh, there's a bear, and oh, there's a lion chasing an animal. antelope. Uh, I'm staring at an acoustic tile ceiling, looking at all the patterns and not able to move anything. And I'm just envisioning, trying to envision constellations and images of things that remind me about the kept promises of God. And you can't not know James 1.5. For if you lack wisdom, all it takes is a contrite, penitent heart and ask, and it will be granted beyond measure. So the takeaway I'd like you all to leave today is the big picture is full of distractions that can keep us seriously seriously disorientated. The two biggest components of the big picture are unity and love, and that's the testimony that this church has had in spite of the different people that have filled this pulpit, in spite of the people that have been on the board of elders. You know, we've been meeting for 35 years. That's over 400 meetings. I can never remember, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, I can never remember a single vote this board ever took that wasn't unanimous. Can you? I don't think so. No. I can never remember. I've got minutes of over 400 meetings. There were were disagreements, but we never came to a point where we were going to vote on a resolution concerning the ministry of this church where we weren't in complete unanimity. Help me, Bob. (laughs) Where, Where we weren't unanimous. This church has been debt-free from day one, never a penny in debt. And that church down there, 200 yards from the north, was built with seven people attending here. New Joseph Bible Church has a role in the big picture. Every one of us have a role in the big picture. And a part of the big picture is a perfect celebratory feast that we're about to participate in. That God allowed his only begotten son to come and pay for every one of our sins so that we could have the unbelievable blessed opportunity to play a part in that big picture. When y'all walk out this door today, I hope you can carry with you for a week Anytime somebody wants to start a conversation about the distractions, change the subject. How is that distraction going to impact your walk with the Lord this moment, this hour, this day? Pastor Jim Frazier told it to me when I had a company of about 100 employees and we were going through the biggest economic disaster, bubble housing bubble crisis, and uh, had no idea how the payroll was going to be met. And Pastor Jim said, Rosie, The darker it gets, the brighter we can shine. And that burned me, just like Miss Kim burned me this morning. (laughs) Guilty, guilty. The darker it gets, the brighter we can all shine. Take that with the empowering encouragement of today's communion and continue to live the testimony of unity and love that this church is established in this community for 35 years. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come to you in thanksgiving for scripture put together over so many years by so many different people that all proclaim one message. Your perfect, supreme position in all things for ever concerning every detail, every distraction, you've got it covered. Ignite in us a new conviction to be a light shining that hope, that love, that unity to everyone within our sphere of influence. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, And uh, Pastor Tom is going to lead us in communion.
I'd like to share with you this morning words from the Apostle Paul to the Church of Corinth as we prepare our hearts and minds to take of a very sacred and special moment. You know, we live in a time of trivialization, things that are holy, things that are important. Sometimes we don't give them the honor that they are due, and that is especially true sometimes of the Lord's Supper, and we must never do that. The Apostle Paul said this, For this is what the Lord himself said, and I pass it on to you just as I received it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. But then he also says this is a very serious thing that we do. So if anyone eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily, that person is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup unworthily, no, not honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Very sacred, holy moment. Not between you and me, but between you and our Lord. I'd like you, as we begin to prepare to take these elements, to take a moment, bow your head, and speak to the Lord and say, Lord, I do remember. I remember my sins, and I remember the cross that makes those sins no more for me. Would you take a moment and bow your head, please?
in the bottom cup, you will find a piece of bread. Would you take it, please? Remember. Remember. Not only did the body of Christ, which was broken on a cross, taking the punishment that I deserved, and quite frankly, you deserved also, that should have been us on the cross. And yet the God of heaven came down. And that's what Christmas is going to be all about. He took human form, not because he needed a vacation, but because he loved us. And not only did his body, was it broken on that cross, but just as the children of Israel in the wilderness needed food called manna, so do we. Heavenly Father, Help us to remember that it is not because of our good deeds that we are saved and forgiven, but it is because of your love for us. And that's a love that just didn't stop on the cross, but it's the manna that feeds us every day of our life. Help us to remember as we take it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the bread, please. We also have the fruit of the vine. We've been talking in our Sunday school class before worship about the plagues and a spectacular movement of God's holy power was when the angel of death moved through Egypt and it killed the firstborn everywhere except those whose houses were painted with the blood of a sacrificial lamb, doorpost and lentil. When the angel saw that mark, it passed over. We also are guilty of so many things. Someday we will see the angel of death. It's only by the blood of Christ that we will be made right with God and enjoy the safety and security of an eternity. Heavenly Father, thank you that this fruit of the vine not only marks us with the Holy Spirit and with the promise of the blood, but that it also sustains us as blood sustains our body. It also reminds us where our life and our energy and our existence come from, not of ourselves, but of you and what you have done for us. Help us to remember that in Jesus' name, amen. Take the cup. Brother Rosie, it is always a privilege to be with you, but thank you for sharing the word this morning. Bible says that an elder is apt to teach. You think that fits him? Amen. Thank you for allowing God to use you this morning to speak to us. Um, Peg, do we have a song that we're going to go out on here? We, do. We, do. we have so much to be thankful for. And Rosie, I do thank you for the big picture. Sometimes we look at all of the distractions personally, nationally. Keep your focus. Keep your focus because no matter what's happening, God wins. God is sovereign. You're his kid. It's okay. All right? Let's stand and say thank you to God as we dismiss. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain.
Go tell it on the mountain, and may this week be a great one in the Lord. Go, go in peace.